All right, I'm excited to be here again. Uh, it was a great conference last time, and it's so much fun to, to come out here and to, to talk to a group I don't usually get to, to see very much of. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about native web components. So these are web components that come with the browser's vanilla JavaScript platform uh, that, in theory, can be used with whatever framework or view library uh, you, you use right now. So we're going to dive into what exactly they mean, how you can use them, and how the stuff you use today is conceptually very close to what's coming in the future. So for those who I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, uh, a little about myself. In addition to being the CTO of Levanto Financial, I spend a lot of time training developers all over the world. Especially in the JavaScript ecosystem, I think there are so many things that you have to you know, get expertise on that one of the big challenges is even if you're a talented developer, there's so much to know. And so I, I spend a lot of time trying to help solve this problem by building really polished video courses and blog articles, and, uh, and I do live workshops to help everyone maximize their potential in the JavaScript world. Before I worked at Levanto, I was the UI architect of Yahoo's ads and data division, where I oversaw the development of their ad platform and about two dozen Ember.js projects. Uh, I teach video courses for frontendmasters.com, which is great to check out if you want to learn directly from framework authors and experts. And I do a lot of open source work uh, several thousand commits per year into JavaScript projects. So the focus today is going to be on one of the biggest challenges we have when building rich browser-based apps. And that is that we are challenged to make a rich experience on the foundation of what originally was intended to be a document viewer for, for websites like Wikipedia, where there isn't a whole lot of interactivity. There's not a whole lot going on. So if you were trying to build a desktop app or a mobile app, whatever you start with, whatever SDK you decide to use, that would come with a lot of great fundamental building blocks. Right? If you build an iOS app, you have a map component that you can just drop right in, and it, you, you can just rely on it working. What we have in the web world is this. We just have these very basic you know, atomic things. And everything we build beyond that is either a library we have to import or something we have to build ourselves. So who, who in here has been using web components for more than three years? What if I told you that this is a web component internally? Who's been using web components for more than three years? All right, a few more people. So, so uh, in, in modern browsers, you have the ability to turn on you know, the, the, the ability to see inside what, to us, seem like these unsliceable contained units, like an input or a text area. And here you can see that this placeholder full name, it's actually internally represented as a div. And there's even some inline style on that div where you can see, you know, what would happen if the placeholder is longer than the input itself. You can see the placeholder gets clipped if there's overflow. So this isn't magic. There's, there's, there are real internals here that we're familiar with. This is probably how you would want to build an input if you had to build one. Uh, but the idea is, what if we need more richness than this? So if we were to build a presentation, we would want it to look something like this. And I apologize if it's a little difficult to see. But I've got a presentation element with two slides in it. The first one has some text, and the second one has an image. The, this is easy to read because it's very connected to the way we think about a presentation. Presentations have slides. Slides have content on them. We don't have to worry about the mechanism by which slides animate on and off the screen, or you know, the only one slide is visible at a time. All of that should be contained within these components themselves. So we want our own vocabulary that, that makes a lot of sense when, you know, as it relates to an idea. 
Right now, what we end up building is something that looks like this. It's, it's the Twitter bootstrap div soup nightmare. So looking at this, can anyone tell me what this is? It is it's hell. It's no fun. So we want something that is readable, maintainable, encapsulated well. And the W3C web component spec promises to be the answer. And this is a fancy name for the combination of four concepts. We've got HTML imports, custom elements, HTML templates, and shadow DOM. And I'm going to try to teach these four things to you today. And it should be pretty easy because we're all using similar concepts, whether you use Angular, Ember, React, Vue, whatever. These all solve problems that something you're using right now also solves. So we're going to go in and look at what each of these four pieces entails. Uh, we're going to go through a basic intro of how they work. And then we're going to look at some real web component examples that will work in uh, Chrome or Firefox. So we're going to build a, a hamburger menu. And you're looking at the, the complete code here. There's zero JavaScript, some unnecessary CSS, and 12 lines of HTML. And this is animated, and uh, the attributes I'm passing in you know, actually end up being represented on the screen. So let's jump in. The concept of HTML imports, it's almost like require, but for HTML. You can think of it as the ability to bring in HTML the same way you bring in CSS. And like any HTML tag that has the ability to bring in some asynchronous resource, like a link tag or a script tag or an image tag, uh, it has on load and on error events. Uh, because HTML can contain JavaScript and style via a script block or a style block, uh, this HTML import can bring all three important pieces at once the structure, the style, and the behavior. And because it's a separate HTML file, it almost has some closure-like characteristics in the sense that scripts that are imported into the thing, uh, scripts that are installed in the thing that are, that's imported, in the HTML file that's imported, they can access the host application, but not the other way around. Right? So there's, there's some encapsulation going on there. Custom elements, uh, this, this part of the spec is where we get the ability to name web components. You know, in, we name it as it makes sense for the purpose of this element. So without custom elements, we could take divs and we could upgrade them. And they could have their own, they could have a lot of web component-like things. But when we look at our HTML, it would still look like div soup. So custom elements are, are very important to, to give us some better semantics. Uh, they bring us lifecycle hooks very similar to what you're used to if you use Ember, React, or Angular 2. Custom elements are extensible, and this is important because if you think about accessibility and the ability to know that a button is a button and it's clickable, if you have a special kind of button, you want to build on top of this base button concept that already comes with the browser. You don't want to start from scratch. So the ability to, to extend things that you already are given uh, is important. And the promise here is that we'll have some degree of interoperability, meaning when you know, the browsers you need to support all can do what I'm going to show you today, you could stop making all of your stuff in React components or Ember components. Some things will likely still be you know, in that framework-driven world, but simple things, uh, this, this will be another option that you can share across products that you know, use different technologies. So the concept be behind HTML templates, it's the ability to bring inert HTML into the DOM. What we mean by inert is the browser does nothing with it. So if you've used handlebars or Jade templates, you know that sometimes you see like a script tag that doesn't contain JavaScript. It contains something else. And the idea is the browser encounters that, and it just leaves it alone. It doesn't parse it. If there's an image tag inside that, that inert piece, it will not go and start to download that image right away, 
only when you do something with it and it's sort of placed in the DOM, you know, with the rest of your application, does the browser start to act on it the way it acts on the rest of HTML. So uh, because of this inertness, we can make some things lazy, right? If there's a script that you only need for this particular component, you'll only download that when the browser needs to render it. You won't have to pay the price of your entire application up front with the first download. The last component here, and uh, potentially the most important and confusing, is Shadow DOM. And the concept here is a separate document fragment owned by each component, where CSS from the application world by default will not penetrate into the components' internals. So, and, and this is very important because CSS essentially is still global programming. Anything can affect anything else if you're not careful. So we're going to dive into each of these now that we kind of know what they are. And hopefully you will see how they fit together, how they're related to your favorite framework ideas, and what all of this work we've done building apps, how that has informed what the web platform is shaping out to be. So HTML templates just look like this. It's the template tag, right? Everything inside the template is treated like a string literal by the browser. It's not evaluated, it's not parsed, it's not made into JavaScript objects uh, that you can't, uh, you can't use query selector to di go inside a template. You just treat this template as an inseparable block that has stuff in it. And as we said, HTML can contain style and behavior. So of course, you can put a style block or a script block inside it. And then the way you use it is first you grab the template by a, a query selector or using jQuery. And then you call this import node function on the document and pass the template's content in. And that will give you a document fragment. And here you can see that we're appending it to the document's body. So here's what that looks like. Uh, on, in the HTML, you can see that I've got a template with an H1 tag in it. This is inert. This would not be shown on the screen if I did not do anything in the JavaScript side. We're grabbing the template. We're grabbing the content off of it and passing it into import node. And then we're appending it to the body. And you can see that it's rendered there. So how do frameworks handle this? So depending on what templates you're used to writing, uh, you might deal with something that looks like this. And the trend is, at build time, your HTML-like things are transformed into JavaScript modules, an ugly mess. And if we look closer, we can see that sometimes these contain imperative instructions for building up this piece of HTML. And the idea is you can pass data in, and then this procedural function will build up the HTML elements that, uh, that you want. In terms of the laziness that comes along with HTML templates, uh, Ember has a concept called lazy engines, which allows you to load chunks of your application only when the user needs them. So if your user's already logged in, you don't need to, to send them the login and the registration screens until they want to go and see them. Then you download it. Angular and React both are sort of adopting Webpack as their official build tool. And they use a concept called chunking, which is similar in that you split your app up and you try to send as little as possible the frame to the user initially so that they see that screen pop up as quickly as possible without having to download a huge piece of JavaScript, and then you know, parse it and evaluate it, uh, which, which all takes time. So that's, that's HTML templates, pretty similar, pretty, pretty related to uh, a lot of the templating solutions that came in, in libraries before it. So let's dig into Shadow DOM. And this is the general concept of Shadow DOM. You've got your application DOM, which we're all used to operating in. And then inside a component, you have another document root. It's like its own document. And you'll notice that I have this component box around the Shadow DOM. 
it's important to realize that the enclosing element is viewable and alterable both from the inside and from the outside. So the internals of a component can sort of style the wrapper element. And you can also style it from the outside. So this boundary is sort of affected by both worlds. So I just want to illustrate how CSS works with shadow roots. You can see here uh, I've got a div where I'm going to put a shadow root. And I've got just a paragraph tag that lives in the application DOM. And the JavaScript that I'm not showing you here, all it's doing is it's grabbing this template, grabbing its contents, right? It's giving this div a shadow root, and it's putting these contents inside this div. And so effectively, we end up you know, with this div having a shadow root inside it with an h1 and a paragraph tag inside that shadow root. You can see that the CSS rule I have, that only styles the, the thing that's in the application DOM. So you would expect that it would style all paragraph tags, but the encapsulation of this shadow root uh, does not permit that rule to penetrate into the component's internals. So by default, none of your CSS will penetrate shadow roots. Uh, the, the host pseudo selector that when used inside a shadow root, that will style the boundary element. So you could have CSS inside an input, and it would sort of style the, the box that wraps the input, that input tag that you're used to working with. Uh, the double colon shadow pseudo selector, when used in the application CSS, can explicitly penetrate into a shadow root. So this is important whenever you have a nice encapsulation tool. Occasionally, you will need to reach into a component and change a style from the outside. But the idea here is to make it so you have to be very explicit about it. So you, you only use it when you need to. And for that reason, the deep pseudo selector, which if you read more into this topic, you may run into material about slash deep slash, that is deprecated. That used to penetrate all shadow roots all the way down. And that's, that's dangerous. That would be like uh, if everyone started using important on all of their CSS. It's sort of, it's an arms race where you just, everything becomes important and then inline and important and it sort of makes things unmanageable very quickly. So how do frameworks handle this? Uh, they're all hacks, all of the framework ways of handling this because ultimately you're gonna end up with CSS and CSS is programming with globals. There's no way around it. There are a couple things that attempt to make this easier by way of having a CSS file or a SAS file or a LESS file on a per component basis and then at build time uh, generating randomly named classes to ensure that component styles will not collide. So this, is, this helps stay organized, but still if you have application level CSS rules, they absolutely can penetrate into components and unintentionally style things that they're not supposed to style. So this is probably one of the most unmanageable parts of building a large application today. Uh, shadow roots are one of the, the things that cannot really be polyfilled at all. There are polyfills, but they, are, they hurt performance so much that you, you, it, they're not really able to be used in production if you care about you know, the speed at which things render. But, uh, this, this will be a game changer when we can start using this in our apps. So if we look at this, there's, there's another interesting thing happening, and I'm moving on to a, a, a non-style related uh, aspect of Shadow DOM now, and it's called content projection. And the idea here is we've got attributes, we've got data being defined in the application world and may be represented in a different way inside the component. This is very important if we want our HTML to start looking closely related to the way we think about an idea instead of closely related to the way we want it to show up on the screen. And that, that, that will be a massive improvement in terms of maintainability if we can start just semantically writing HTML and it's easy to read presentation slide, slide, slide instead of floating things all over the place in a big grid system and, and so on. So this is one type of content projection 
taking an attribute and then putting that value somewhere inside the component's internals. Uh, this is done the way you would expect in that when the component is instantiated, the, the value that's there at that time, that is used and explicitly placed somewhere. And then any future updates and things are done by way of events. So if you adhere to that same convention, uh, frameworks like React and Ember and Angular 2 are going to be able to bind to this the same way that they bind to any other component. So this will get us the interoperability we're looking for without the need for two-way binding you know, at this component level. The two-way binding can be done you know, by a library or by a framework. The other and the more interesting type of content projection that is less obvious is uh, uh, dealing with a component that has an inner HTML, like a text area. And you can see here that we're passing in something inside the text area, and then we've got an editor here, which is presumably the thing that we can type letters in, but then we've also got this content here. This is sort of, if nothing is present in the editor, if the value is empty, then we will display this text. So how does this work? Well, I'm going to show you a slightly more complicated example to, to illustrate the different ways you can project content. And here it is. So we've got similar JavaScript to what's, what's been used in that um, we are upgrading this div such that it uses this template. This is sort of the components template, right? And then we're going to basically do something similar to the way jQuery plugins uh, typically work. You know, I'm, I'm sure everyone's made a menu out of like a UL with a bunch of LIs, and jQuery will come along, like your plugin will come along and eat that HTML and replace it with something completely different. So we don't end up eating this HTML. It'll still be there, but the representation on the screen will be different. Just like when we look back at, at this, we may have this here when we, do, when we look at our Elements tab in our dev tools, but in terms of what's actually shown to us on the screen, this is really what we're seeing. So what's happening here is I've got a span with the word good in it, and that span has an H1 class, and then I've got a paragraph tag here. When we turn this into a component, and we use this template as the basis of the component, you can see that we've got these content tags here. So what this content tag up here does is it's going to find everything in this inner HTML that matches this selector. So it's going to find this span. And it's going to take, it's going to put anything it finds in place of that content tag there. It'll actually be in the H1, which is why even though you see span here, uh, it's, you, you see that the word good is showing up large, like an H1. And then this, when, when we don't use a select attribute on the content tag, it sort of puts everything else that you haven't plucked off by some other means, it drops the rest there. And so that's why we get this hello world uh, after this paragraph that will always be present there. So we can see hello world shows up here, right? That's where this content tag is. Here is this paragraph tag that's always there, and then good is in the H1. And, and what I want you guys to notice is the way style is affected. Uh, you can see that at the application level, we're basically saying that any paragraph tags you find inside this div, good host, should be blue. And you can see that stuff in here, this is affected by the CSS. Stuff that is still part of the, the components you know, inside world, that is not affected. So this paragraph tag is not affected by this rule. This paragraph tag is, right? So the component in this case is almost like a frame around application DOM. The way content projection works in your favorite framework, uh, Ember has a concept called yield, which basically works the same way as the content tag does. Uh, Angular 2 has ng content. Uh, Angular 1, uh, you would use transclude for this. And in React, you have this.props.children as the means of placing you know, the components in HTML uh, somewhere within the components sort of private area. Again, we don't have shadow roots 
in any of these frameworks. There's no efficient way to polyfill it, but this is how content is sort of moved around in these libraries. All right, so we've got HTML templates, we've got Shadow DOM. The next concept is HTML imports, and this one's easy. It looks a lot like the way you bring CSS in. The way you get the content from an import is you query for it and you use the dot import attribute and you will get a document fragment. And then uh, in order for a script that is present in the thing being imported to access the JavaScript context, context of the application, uh, you just have to do document.currentscript.ownerdocument. And at that point, like owner document will return the application's document object. So then you can proceed further. So this is the closure-like characteristic that I was talking about, except um, sort of in reverse. Well, not, not in reverse. The inside world can access the outside world. The outside world cannot access the inside world. So how do frameworks handle this? Modules, right? This is essentially like a modular way of containing a component's stuff. So oftentimes, like if you're dealing with Angular, you might have your style and your structure and your behavior all in one file. In Ember, this will typically be more than one file. Uh, in React, you know, you'll have your styles and you'll have your render method, which is the structure, and you'll have your behavior, which is all of your, your actions and things. So finally, we're at the last, the last of the four pieces, uh, and this is custom elements. And big recent news in custom elements is that Safari's nightly preview within the last two weeks shipped its implementation of custom elements. And we've been waiting for a long time for this. Uh, it's, it's a big step towards actually being able to use this in a non-polyfilled way. So it's coming, it's coming soon. So the idea of why this is important, and I did not have this, this slide for each of the other steps because I look at custom elements as the thing that brings all four of these concepts together. So custom elements are what give us these composable building blocks, right? So we talked about some things that give us encapsulation, they give us lazy loading, they give us the ability to have something inert that we only, can, we only pay the price for when we need it. This is what gives us good composition patterns. Uh, it gives us component lifecycle hooks. So you can run something when a component's instantiated when it's inserted into the DOM. You can clean up after yourself as it's torn down to make sure that you know, your set interval is cleared interval. <laughs> uh, components, uh, sorry, uh, custom elements give us this extensibility and they are the magic piece that aligns our HTML with our mental model of, of actually what we're trying to build. It gives us these custom names in the HTML itself. So we're going to go through an example of a building one really quick. The first thing you want to do is create a prototype for your custom element. And you will, in this case, we're going to grab the prototype of the button element, the HTML button element. This is just a button tag. And we're going to clone it and hold on to that value. And then when we create our new element with this document.registerElement method, um, we're going to pass it a couple things. First, we're going to pass it this mega dash button string. And this is the name of the element as you want to refer to it in HTML land. And then the, the options object we pass as a second argument essentially uh, needs us to specify the prototype in, or the, the parent element in two ways. And I'm talking about parent in terms of a class hierarchy. Right, this is what it extends from. So we pass it the JavaScript uh, version of our prototype, and then we pass it the HTML tag that it extends. So it does not have that information from, from this in and of itself. So here we're basically saying that mega button is represented by this tag, and it extends HTML button element, which in HTML land is represented with the button tag. So as to how we use this, um, you, you have to think about lifecycle hooks, right? Because this, this would not really do anything other than be a button by a different name. So you can define callbacks like this created callback here. 
And what we're doing essentially here is we're creating a new HTML element that's just extending from the base class, HTML element. Uh, and then our created callback is going to grab a template that we've imported up here, and we're going to use template content, content and import node, as we were doing with the simpler examples. And essentially, we're going to create a shadow root and append the contents of this template to the shadow root. So this is how we get a custom element. You have sort of the, the tag, and then when it's instantiated, you give it a shadow root, you grab something from a template, and you put it underneath that shadow root. And now you have sort of a more meaningful custom element. Apparently, I highlighted these things. <laughs> so how do frameworks handle these things? Everyone has a component concept these days and the W3C web component standard and the lifecycle hooks and the need for content projection. All of that has been informed by how people use the major frameworks and libraries, right? That's why you see this strong alignment. This is, this is sort of a, a, a reversal of the way web standards used to be figured out and defined, where a bunch of smart people would get together in a room, decide how things should be, and then we would all use them. Now what happens is we all use frameworks and libraries, and then these smart people get together and they try to pick the best ideas and the most important ones from what's in use today, and then we're going to build them into the web platform. Uh, so so that's, that's why you know, th this is a better way of doing things because it ensures that the needs we already have, the problems we're solving today, they'll just be solved in a different way, in a more consistent way across all apps in the future. So with that, I want to go through a, a quick demo, and it's going to be a hamburger menu. And uh, if you get a hold of my slides, uh, either on Twitter or uh, I, I guess they'll be posted to the website after the fact, I have code pen links for, for all of these things. But I, I kind of want to help you understand you know, how, these, how these different components, uh, these different concepts fit together. So in this example, which we already looked at, um, we've just got, oh, thank you. So we've got a template here, and we've got some JavaScript. And if I comment this JavaScript out and save it, I hope the internet holds up here, you can see that nothing's rendered on the screen. This is inert HTML inside the template. The fact that we've kind of cloned it, cloned the contents of the template, and added it to the body. That's what makes this visible. So uh, in this example, we are, uh, we're creating a shadow root and building on this concept of a template. So here, we're grabbing a div. We're creating a, a shadow root underneath that div. We're grabbing a template. And then we're taking the shadow root we just created and appending the contents of that template to the shadow root. And if we inspect element on this, you'll be able to see here's our div, and then here's this shadow root here. So uh, I'm going to jump into this hamburger menu here, because it's, it's, it's pretty cool how, how all this stuff works. So the takeaway here, this is vanilla HTML JavaScript and uh, less. So we've got a ton of HTML. It's, it is the usual div soup that we're used to re looking at. In fact, here you can see like I even have to represent this icon as three lines. We've got a ton of CSS that has to do with um, making sure that my cursor is correct when hovering over the right things and make sure that this thing animates in and out the way I would expect, changes colors, et cetera, et cetera. And then we've got a lot of JavaScript that listens to the button for clicks and adds a class to the menu, which causes the CSS animation to start. So all of the things that you would expect with, with something like this. So this next iteration of it, which, which works exactly the same way, uh, what we've done is we've combined, we've, we've taken some of our HTML, and we've put it into two templates. One for the menu itself, which has a style block, and then here's our icon. 
And here we've got like the, the fly out portion, which is currently not on the screen. And then here's our content for like the internals of the menu. This is where the menu items are going to go. And then the menu items themselves, uh, we've got style, we've got the content of the menu items, and then uh, that's, that's basically it. We've got a caption here, and we're just gonna grab an attribute off of the element in JavaScript and programmatically just inner HTML equals to, to move the caption into, into this div here. And then what we can do is we can use this nice, very clean way of, uh, of building a hamburger menu in a way that anyone can understand. Your designer can come to this and they will know exactly what you're trying to do here. But there's still, you know, a lot of complexity here. It's almost like, it almost looks worse in that we've had to slice things up, we've had to move a lot of, you know, our CSS into inline CSS blocks, style blocks, and we actually have more lines of JavaScript because we have to do all of the work to create these custom elements and to go create the shadow roots and to move the contents of the template into the shadow roots and so on. Once we take all of this stuff and we move it into a single HTML file and, and use this, the fourth pillar, HTML imports, we get this, where we can bring in our HTML via this link. And here's our HTML. And this is all the style. And you see it works exactly the same way. So this is pretty cool, right? Especially when you consider that in your application that you're using today, you could, you could bind to this with Ember. You could use this inside your render method with React. This can be mixed with, with whatever you're using right now. So the idea in the future is that some of what you do, the simpler components, those could look like this. They could be written in vanilla JavaScript and this will allow you to kind of share things between people that use different technologies. So that's all I have. I hope you guys give this a try and look a little deeper because it's pretty cool what, what you can do with it. Thank you.